there is something that has been spinning in my spirit. And that is freedom. <laughs> freedom. Freedom that manifests itself in many different forms and functions. And so I want to preach on freedom today, but it's coming from a different mindset, I guess. And anytime I speak on freedom, I always need to define what I mean by freedom. And the best definition I've ever been given for freedom was from uh, my professor, David Norris. He said, freedom is, the, is knowing what is right from wrong and having the ability to do right. It's not doing whatever you want to do. It's having the ability to do what is right. And I believe that God is trying to step into our lives and probably over the next six weeks or so, he's trying to step into our lives to give us the concept of freedom, true freedom, the ability to do that which is right. I sense if you're anything like me, sometimes you know what to do is right, but you don't have the ability to do it. Not because of some external pressure or oppression, but because you just can't get yourself to do it. You just can't force yourself to step into it. And you have been given a construct that has hampered and hindered what God wants to do for you. And I believe over the next couple of weeks and and I'm not saying that I'm going to be speaking every Sunday on freedom, but it's stirring in my spirit from all different avenues. And I don't know if it's going to culminate with our Chain Breakers Conference on the 22nd and 23rd of July or not, but uh, I already know what I'm preaching. i got six weeks to prepare for that message. So look out for Friday night. And then on Saturday we're going to have a bunch of different sessions and, and we're going to walk away from that Saturday totally transformed. So I want you all to be a part of it. But I'm reading from Colossians chapter 2 today. And uh, if you want to keep your Bibles open and follow along, I'm going to preach kind of like I do in Grace College, which by the way, there is no Grace College this week. We'll meet again a week from Thursday. And then on top of that, let me just make this announcement, and we'll announce it more coming up. But I've got about three Thursday nights left for the book of Hebrews. And then we're going to probably take a short break. And then starting either the end of August or the beginning of September, I'm inviting everybody back to what we used to call midweek service, <clears throat> at least for a series. It's going to be on Thursday nights. But I am going to teach in depth on something I have said that I would never teach on. And so I'm going to teach on eschatology, the book of Revelation, the book of Daniel, the end times, what's going on. I never taught it before because there's so many different views and it can get confusing because of all the different views, but I believe the Lord has been helping me get everything into a structure that can really make sense and uh, release the fear, and it's going to make what we experience here on Sundays mean so much more because of the understanding of the whole concept of eschatology. Eschatology is the study of the end times. So we're going to be presenting that on Thursday nights in place of Grace College, and we're inviting everybody to come. We'll have it here in the sanctuary. There will still be catalysts, but we'll meet in here as the adults, and and uh, any kids that you want to bring, and, and we're just going to have church. I'm going to just share the book of Revelation and, and uh, let you know what the beast is and the dragon is. And Praise God. Colossians is an interesting letter, but it's, so, it's only four chapters. 
but it's so powerful and so deep. The letter to the church in Colossians was a letter from the Apostle Paul because somewhere along the line he had gotten a report that in the midst of that church, some heretical thinking began to spring up. And that heretical thinking was found in two, a blending of two subjects. <clears throat> the first subject was extreme Judaism, which means that they went back to the form and function of Old Testament law and principles. And they were requiring those new Christians. Now, you have to remember Coloss Colossi, I think is how they say it, and who knows, Colossians, I'll just use the book. <laughs> the church of Colossians, these are mostly Gentile believers that are in this church. I'm sure there was some Jews that were there, but mostly the area around the church of Colossians was Gentile believers, and it had crept into the church that these non-Jew believers had to take on and perform some of the functions of the Old Testament Jewish system. And they blended that part of it with what is known today as Gnosticism. It was, uh, uh, it's a term that they simply tried to blend the concept of Greek mythology into Christianity. And so a Gnostic believed that the creator of the earth was a low-level div divine being. And uh, they used the word demiurge. And Jesus was the lowest emissary in the history or the dealing with earth. In fact, they went so far as to say that everything about creation and God and religion and faith and all of those things, they, they coined a, a certain term, and it was esoteric. Now, those are nice terms until you figure out what they say. Esoteric simply means this, things that are hidden that only a few can have revealed to. In other words, this church of Colossians was allowing a thought process to come in that said that the normal person couldn't know about Jesus because Jesus was esoteric. He was hidden and, and veiled, and so you had to jump through all these kinds of hoops to figure out who he was, and it was only a few that were going to do it. So because of those people that were smart enough to figure it out, they had all the answers. Instead of allowing Jesus to be the creator of creators and step into their life and just be with them, they were... A seemingly having to jump through a bunch of different hoops. And so I want to preach about freedom today, and I'm just going to go kind of line by line preaching today. This is kind of a mixture of how I would teach and preach of the book of Colossians chapter 2, starting at verse number 1. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ. Paul is flattening out the arguments that God is esoteric and you can't know him. He's basically telling these people in the church of Colossae that you have the opportunity today to recognize and understand this thing that others are saying is a mystery, and the mystery is just being revealed, and the mystery is Christ. Can I tell you why Christ is such a mystery? Because it makes absolutely no sense that God who created everything would become a little baby born in Bethlehem. It makes absolutely zero sense why a pure, holy, righteous 
God would wrap himself in the form of a human being and take upon him all of the restrictions of the human being and had to sleep and had to eat and had to deal with unfair chores and had to do with all kinds of things that you and I have had to deal with. And not only that, but then become a curse for us and hang on a tree for us. It doesn't make sense. But we can still know him. I can still know who Jesus is. And so that's why Paul is writing. And he says it this way. uh, In verse number 3, In whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. When you understand who Jesus is, everything else opens up to understanding. When you have a relationship with Jesus, everything in this book begins to make sense. When you know Jesus, you know the Creator. When you know Jesus, you know the Savior. When you know Jesus, you know the Provider. When you know Jesus, when you know Jesus, you can know everything about this Word. Well, Pastor, there's no way I'm going to know it all. Right, we're not, but you have the ability to. But he knows that ultimately when we see him is when we're going to know him, for we shall see him as he is, First John 3, 2. So verse number 4, I say this in order that no one, everybody say no one, may delude you with plausible arguments. Listen, there are some arguments in the world today and arguments even within the church that make it plausible that Jesus may not be God. They make arguments, well, if God is so good, why is all the bad things happening? How many have ever heard that? If God really loved me, why did he allow me to go through this? How many have ever thought that? (laughs) If God really did this and really was this, and if Jesus really did care for me and die for me, why do I feel so condemned and guilty and full of shame? How many have ever experienced that? Those are plausible arguments. But the apostle is trying to tell somebody, don't let those arguments delude you from the truth because the truth is going to set you free. When you understand that just because something doesn't go right in this world, that God has not turned his back on you. He has not given up on you. He has not lost sight of where you're at. He knows exactly what's going on, and he just wants you to call on him. So don't get deluded. For though I am absent in body, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and firmness of your faith in Christ. Therefore, anytime you see a therefore, you know to tie the previous with the next statement. Because of what I am just stating to you, therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. Can I tell you, That word received, we don't understand necessarily. I can tell you, I was going to give her my wallet, but I don't trust, no, I'm just kidding. See, I can give her the keys, and if she takes them, then she has received my gift, correct? But that's not what the word received means here. The word received in the Greek text means this, to be given, if you will, through a transfusion or to be transmitted into. In other words, David, what just experienced 
in, in just a few minutes ago, what you were experiencing was a transmission or an, a, a trans, uh, transmission or a, a translation into your spirit, a, a, a something that gives to you, whether you received it or not, it was placed on the inside of you it, without you even understanding. You made yourself available and he poured it in. It didn't mean you had to do anything. Some of us have been trying to do stuff to receive from him. And what God is trying to say to somebody today, I'm ready to infuse you. I'm ready to transmit it into you. All you need to do is open up and let me come in. But we as churches for so long and as, and as spiritual leaders have given us, we talked about it in our all-in class this morning, the laundry list of things, check this, check this, check this, check this. And then we have justification for why we don't check some of them. It's not about a checklist of things that you need to do. All you need is open up and let him transmit it into you. And if he has transmitted into you, walk in him. Take that step. Listen, tomorrow, walk in him. What you sensed around this altar today, walk in it tomorrow. Not because of anything that you can do, but something was transmitted from him to you. Something was transfused into you. Something was given to you that you received, whether you realize it or not, and you will recognize it as you walk in him. Some of you are getting it. I'm not to the good part yet. Rooted and built up in him and established in the faith just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one, everybody say no one, takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit. Can I just tell you what philosophy, but most theologians believe that this Greek word, it meant more than just a love of esoteric wisdom. Remember esoteric, unknown, hidden? And those that are philosophers, they try to philosophize over everything because they're so much smarter than anybody else that they can see into the secret things of understanding and wisdom. And so they philosophize about it. They never come up with an answer. They just talk in circles. But a step beyond that, most theologians and even some historians believe that when the apostle uses this word, he's not only referring to that esoteric concept, but that there was something going through the churches at that time called theosophy. A blending of theology and philosophy. And the terms that the theologians applied it to now is theosophy. And theosophy is the, is the concept that taught this, that there was an ancient brotherhood of gods called masters. And each individual god have had a different relation with the church. And so the people of the churches of that day were taking the Greek philosophy and, and the Roman philosophy of all of the different gods that were out there and were trying to bring that thought into the church. Can I tell you that's why they talked in circles? Because the Bible says there is only one. There is only one. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. The Lord is one. There is no other beside me. You shall have no other gods before me. What was happening in this church in Colossae, what was happening was that the concept of multiple gods was starting to water down the truth that the one God Almighty loved them enough to pay the ultimate sacrifice enough for for them, and they got all kind of twisted and around. Now, you, you, you may look at me and say, well, there's no way that's ever coming into our church today. 
well, maybe not so much as God's, but there are things that we have placed in our life on the pedestal of a God, and we have almost equated our purpose with the purpose of following him. It may be a job. It may be a home. It may be a relationship. It may be your finances. It may be your education. It may be all kinds of things that you have elevated to the point of where God gets distracted. You get distracted from God. You almost put a cloud over him so that you can focus on this. And my God is trying to tell somebody today, it's time not to get caught up in the philosophy of man. Start looking back to him. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. That's hard to do. I know. There's so much stuff going on in the world. My wife got home on Thursday, Wednesday or Thursday. What would you guys call your car? Yeah, he's kind of given up on us a little bit. We got to get it looked at. We got to get it worked on. And and, and we bought that from them a couple years ago for Owen. And and, uh, we won't blame Owen for the problems, but... It did happen after my wife started driving, so I guess. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So you have a car issue. Have church issues. Met with two guys about the things this week. Looking at the things around. I just got in the mail today. Uh, Randy brought me the mail today, and I just looked in there. And our court case from back there is uh, pretty much done now. And uh, our insurance is going to get paid back, and then we're going to get a little bit of money eventually, hopefully sometime. That's another thing. What's happening here next week? What's happening here the following? We can get so many things that it clouds over. And I'm not talking about negative things only. It can be positive. It can be good things. But when good things become so good that it blocks God out, it becomes a bad thing. That's what they were talking about here. Then he says, uh, empty deceit. That word empty means devoid of spiritual truth. Okay. Has anybody been on the Internet? There is some empty stuff out there. Listen, if you're listening to things or reading things on the Internet, make sure it lines up with this. Because if it doesn't line up with this, it's an empty deceit. It's trying to get you locked up and locked into things that don't really matter. Let let me just make this statement, and I don't want to qualify it, but I'm just going to make the statement. Don't get so consumed in politics that you miss out who's in charge of politics. Now, I pray for our president. I hope the best for him. Do I agree with him? Not very often. But here's one thing I do agree with him on. Romans 13 says God put him there. That's quiet. The Bible says he sets them up and he puts them down. God is the one that's in control, even when everything's seen. So why should I get locked up in things that he's already controlling? You can eat on that later, feed on that later. According to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, that doesn't mean elementary That means of the elements. There is a spiritist movement in the world that is not spiritual. And they hold in their hands crystals and elements of this world trying to divinate about what's going on and what's happening. 
Can I just tell you that's not anything new? It's as of Satan today as it was years ago, and they were having that in this church. Not according to Christ. Everything needs to center around Christ. Everything needs to center around Christ. Can I tell you what will make you free? Is when Jesus becomes the hub of your life and not the spoke of your life. When Jesus becomes the axle instead of a part of the wheel. Listen, my friend, Jesus, the, the, the proverb wrote it this way, acknowledge him in all your ways. Yeah. See, that doesn't make sense to some of us. Why would I acknowledge him if I'm just getting lunch? Because it's one of the ways. Why should I acknowledge him as to which grocery store to go to? Because it's one of my ways. Why should I acknowledge him where I take my car to? Because it's one in all of your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. Do you want to understand why some of us get lost and we wander and we end up in the wrong neighborhood spiritually, so to speak? It's because we stopped acknowledging him. If you want to have true, lasting freedom, get him off of the spoke of your life and make him your life. Jesus can't just be another aspect of the wheel. Each one of our lives, if you break our lives down, is, and I don't know why these people do it, but pie. Everything is related to food. You get a pie chart. And you break your life down. And this sliver of pie is your kids. And this sliver of pie is your wife. And this sliver of pie is your job. And this sliver of pie is your hobby. And this sliver of pie is the church. And this sliver of pie is whatever. Can I tell you, Jesus never better be a sliver of the pie. If you want true freedom, Jesus is the, 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 the post where the pie spins on. You know, those magicians that can hit those things, spinning plates, and, and you get that spinning just like Jesus is the thing that holds everything up. He holds your sliver of your kids. He holds the sliver of your marriage. He holds the sliver of your church. He holds the sliver of your... If it's Jesus holding it all, you will experience true freedom. I I know some of you are grabbing that, and it doesn't sound as exciting as what it is, as powerful as it is. But when you wake up tomorrow, if you put Jesus first, your day will be better. If you wake up and go to work tomorrow with a song of Jesus on your heart, it's going to make your day go a lot smoother. I know there may even be things that happen that that seem to be detrimental, but if your spirit is in tune with the one that's in control, it doesn't matter if you get a flat tire, you'll just whistle to Jesus while you change it. While you're calling AAA, you'll just call them and say, hey, I've got a flat tire. While I'm waiting on you, I'm going to worship a little. Let me just tell you, when Jesus is the center of everything, it makes all of the junk of this world easier to handle. Here's the reason why. Verse number 9. For in him, that him is Christ, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. When you see Jesus, you see God. I'll tell you what that does for me. I close my eyes, and I see Jesus on the cross. And I recognize it. It's God's humanity. That's how much he loves me. And not only that, Paul doesn't stop there. He says it this way. In him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. And you have been filled 
in him. That word filled means you have been made complete in Jesus. Listen, you may think you have it all together, and if you do, don't come anywhere near me. I'll mess you all up. But if you have everything all together, it's because you are complete in Jesus. I may be falling apart naturally, but I'm complete in him. I don't just get a little tiny bit of Jesus. I got them all. I don't have to just pray for just a little bit of blessing. I can get the whole thing. I can, I can hold hands hand. I don't, you know, my dad, my dad's hand was huge. And so when I walked around as a kid, he never gave me his hand to hold. He just stuck his pinky out, and that's what I held. Jesus doesn't just give me a pinky. He's got the whole palm of his hand holding on to me. All the, I, I hope somebody gets the freedom that this, I know some of you are even sitting here saying, well, this, that, that, that sounds really good, but I just don't feel that today. Everything seems to be going wrong. Jesus doesn't seem to be anywhere near me. Listen, my friend, just make sure he's in the center, and even when you don't feel like it, he's holding you. who is the head of all rule and authority. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. This is an argument against Judaism because in the Jewish culture the sign that you were a Jew was the concept of circumcision. It was the separating uh, of humanity from God. It was the symbol of that. And what Paul is saying, stop arguing about something that's already been paid for. You have been circumcised with a circumcision not made with hands. You've been circumcised by the power and the presence of God. Well, how is that? Verse 12 tells us, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead, and you who were dead in your trespasses and uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgive us all of our trespasses. Listen, you're free. You're not free because you were pardoned. You were free because he took your penalty. Verse number 14, by canceling the record of debt. Can I tell you what the Greek word really means by that? Obliterating it. Nothing left over. canceling a record that stood against you with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. When he took those nails in his hands and on his feet, he was saying, innocent, 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 innocent. If you're not innocent, you haven't been to the tree because the tree holds your sins. You have been made innocent by the blood of the Lamb. And when you are buried with Him in baptism and risen to a new life in Him, that sin that you had no longer exists. Listen, you gotta, you got to grab this. If it no longer exists, it can no longer have power. If it can no longer have power, you are free to serve Jesus. So, don't let somebody confuse you. Not only, I want you to notice verse number 15, and I'm just about done. I, I was going to say I promise, but. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to an open shame by triumphing over them in him. Listen, when Jesus hung on that cross, most people would think it was a bloody mess. <laughs> but can I tell you what it was? It was trophy time. 
the music began to play. What music was that? The earthquake and the lightning. All of heaven began to play their music. All earth gave up their sound. Why? Because all of the spiritual demons in hell, in heaven, in earth, wherever they were at, were looking at the prized possession that when Jesus paid the ultimate price and the last nail went in, it wasn't a defeat, it was a champion crowned. It was when Jesus allowed us to step into something brand new. Can I tell you, there's nothing I liked better playing hockey, growing up, than beating the bullies. The ones who thought they were better than we were because they were bigger than we were. And there was always something just special at the end of the tournament when they called the tartan team up and we were getting the gold. And we looked over to Little Canada and they were getting the silver. I know that sounds petty, but can I tell you something? When the spirits start messing with me, here's what I do. Okay, come with me. Come on, come here. You, you stick close to me. Because I'm going to go stand on the podium where my Savior is and see where you're left standing. Hey, listen. The psalmist said he was going to prepare a table in the presence of our enemies. Can I just tell you, I cannot wait. I don't know if he'll be able to see it or not. But I can't wait for Satan to watch us sitting around the supper of the Lamb. Hey, Satan, what do you think of me now? I know some of you are laughing, but you got to get this in your spirit. Stop listening to the voice of the enemy that says you're not anything. Get into your mind and into your picture. Who's yours? You are part of the family of God. Hey, Satan, you may think you own me right now. You don't have any ownership dealings with me at all. There's coming a day, my friend, when I'm going to be sitting at the supper of the Lamb, the marriage supper of the Lamb, and you're going to be sitting in a bottomless pit. Listen, my friend, you think you're something right now? I just want you to know something. I've already made my way to Jesus, and Jesus is a little bit bigger than you are. I don't know about you, my friend, but you, you're trying to trip me up, and you're trying to cause me to think this and this and this and this and this and that, and you're trying to, to say that I'm nothing. Here's what I'm trying to tell you. I've been bought with a price. Uh, that may be who I was, but now I have a name attached to me. My name has been changed. My character has been changed. My mindset has been changed. I am now washed in the blood of the Lamb. Oh, then you can tell him to shut up. Uh, give me five more minutes, and then I'm done. Because verse 16, there's another word there. Therefore, because Jesus did this, because of everything I read between verses 6 and and verse 15, let no one, everybody say no one. Are you getting the theme of this? No one, not, any, not even you yourself, let no one pass judgment on you. Let nobody judge you in questions of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath all of the basic tenets of Judaism and philosophy. Don't let those pass judgment on you. They are just a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Jesus. The substance is what causes the shadow. 
The substance. I want to be with the substance, not with the shadow. I want to get lost in the substance and not get tied up in the shadows. Let me just tell you, my friend, nobody can judge me because I have found the substance. Hey, I don't say that boastingly. I say that humbly. Can I tell you who's the one that judges me the most and the worst? Me. Self-judgment. Thinking I'm not doing what I should be doing. Well, I'm not doing enough. Who said? I need to be doing more for Jesus. Who told you that? Well, pastor, we're supposed to be busy and occupied till Jesus comes and busy about the kingdom. I, I understand that. But who told you how much and how little and how often? Because there is a thing that Jesus did that said he's rested. And maybe you're in a rest season. So stop beating yourself up if you're in a rest season. And get ready to get running when he opens the door of opportunity to run. These are shadows. Let no one disqualify you. Everybody say it again. No one. Let no one disqualify you insisting on asceticism and worship of angels. Can I tell you what asceticism is? It's severe self-discipline and avoidance of all forms of indulgence. Listen, are there some things that you have to cut off? Yes. But you don't cut them off to get good. You get to cut them off because God made you good. You don't beat yourself up in asceticism and avoid all forms of indulgence and lock yourself in a room for the rest of your life and say, he saved me, he made me good, I can't mess it up now. Because the minute you say you can't mess it up, you've already messed it up. Because he didn't put you in a place to be in a box. He didn't try to give you a laundry list of thou shalt and thou. Listen, my friend, the Bible says the law was fulfilled in Christ. What Christ tells you to do, that's what you need to do. Let nobody disqualify you. Going on in detail about visions. Can I just tell you? If the visions don't line up with this, it's bad pizza. I'm sorry. I told you we are living in a spiritist generation, not a spiritual, a spiritist. And there are all kinds of people out there with all kinds of visions and thoughts and ideas. Don't let them tangle you up. Jesus has already been revealed in the Word of God. By the way, if you noticed, I'm just reading the word. This isn't me talking. Puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind and not holding fast to the head from whom the whole body nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments grows with a growth that is from God. Listen, my friend, be careful what you listen to, what you watch, and what you see because it could be something that has uh, puffed up in their own minds, in their own thinking, but they have detached themselves from the head. If it's not centered around Jesus, it's not for me. I've had to stop listening to some preachers because they have detached themselves from the head and they're preaching doctrines now that they have come up with, that they make it sound nice and cool and, and neat, but it's, dis it's detached from the head, which is Christ. Can't listen to them anymore. If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? Do not touch, do not taste, do not uh, handle. Referring to things that all perish as they are used according to human precepts and teachings. Now listen. I know we had, God just moved after songs. 
pastor's given some heavy word. But can I just tell you, we are living in an age of deception. And you've got people all over the television, in the newspaper, telling you what you can eat and can't eat, where you can go and can't go, what you can handle and can't handle. Listen, I'm not even talking about just churches. I'm just talking about politicians and scientists and this and that. Let me just tell you, if it's in here, it's for me. I don't care what the scientists tell you because science is an offshoot of God, not the other way around. That's just an aside. But here's what I want you to notice that Paul says in the last verse of this chapter. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom. What's the appearance of wisdom? Going back into this chapter, it's the philosophy, it's the empty deceit, it's the human tradition, it's the elemental spirits. All of those... Going even further down, it's asceticism, it's worship of angels, it's the detail about visions being puffed up, etc., etc. All of those things, according to the Scripture, indeed has an appearance of wisdom. In other words, it sometimes seems to make sense. It sometimes seems to be logical. Can I just tell you, always measure everything by this because if it's not measured by this it's really not logical unless it's found in here but it can seem that but look what it does those things that indeed have an appearance of wisdom promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body Can I tell you the reason why this church wants anybody whosoever will to come into it? Because Jesus welcomes whosoever will. Some of you ask, well, what do I need to become a member of this church? Come to this church. You mean you don't do, I know churches out there and they have their reasons and I don't want to cast aspersions, but they have interviews and you got to sign off on paper and you got to do this and you got to do that to be members of a church and, and, and jump through a bunch of hoops that I don't find in Scripture. It sounds wise. It gives the appearance of wisdom. It gives the appearance of, uh, of even uh, uh, an appearance of being right with God. But can I tell you what it does? It promotes a self-made religion. Jesus didn't hinder people from reaching him. So why should I? We don't have a laundry list of things that you've got to do to be a part of Spirit of Grace Church. You need to reach out to Jesus and we'll embrace you on the way, and we'll love you, and if it's in here, we'll direct you to it. If there's things that need to change in your life based off of the scriptural principles, we'll let Jesus handle that with you. Because this isn't Tim Sanders' church. This isn't Randy Esparza's church. This isn't our board's church. This isn't our leader's church. This is his church. It's Jesus, church. But they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. They are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. Philosophies, empty deceit, man-made rules, man-made religion, man-made ideas, man-made concepts, they don't do anything to help the man. That's what that's saying. 
Can I tell you when I send somebody to a therapist, I'm only going to send them to a Christian therapist because a Christian therapist understands that all of the structures, that all of the training and all of the classes and the schooling that they get, if it's not based in the Word of God and in Christ, it's not going to help the man. It'll sound wise, it'll sound good, but it doesn't indulge. There's no valuable to keep you from indulging in it in the flesh. Can I tell you when we sit down with somebody and give them advice and talk to them and try to help them, it has to be found in this. It's not found in some science book. It's not found in some laboratory. It's found in Jesus because man-made stuff doesn't stop us from messing up man. You'd think that that would make more sense. But man, we mess it up. I invite you to stand.